Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, call on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name, in the name of the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that our God sings our God sings there is Lifted on your wings, and the world will see that. Yes, the world will see that. Our God saves. Our God saves. There is hope in your name. Hello? Hi, it's on now. Sorry, guys, that's me. It's, I'm supposed to be talking. So I'm going to talk. Um, we're just going to pray right now for the contribution, so if you guys would uh, bow your heads with me. Dear God in heaven, uh, we thank you for this day. It's so beautiful to uh, be here um, at our new church building, and uh, it's really exciting. But uh, God, we just want to pray right now as we uh, give back to you. Uh, God, I was just thinking about this last night and just... Um, you know, that scripture about uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, where your uh, treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I uh, just think about, you know, what is our treasure? What is my treasure? 
And uh, just think about, uh, you know, whether it's my money or my time or what I'm thinking about every day, God, um, that's my treasure. And um, so, you know, as we get back to you, God, today, I just want to pray that uh, we'll just give with uh, cheerful hearts and that we'll be happy to give back to you, God, because you're our treasure. Um, God, we love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Just a couple of announcements before we get back into worship. First of all, welcome uh, to the new property. Uh, please uh... want to uh, just say uh, thank you to everybody. I think pretty much everybody's had a hand in this at some point in time through the planning, through the purchasing, through the labor that's gone into just making this accessible for you today. Uh, lots of work with the tech ministry, getting this to sound good and look good and children's ministry, and we'll continue to expand and grow into our full-fledged service uh, as we uh, just get going, but we're excited to be here. As you can see, uh, it's a beautiful and peaceful property. It's not just a building, but it's a place where we can gather, meet with God, and then be sent out to share God with everybody else. So uh, please take time after service, explore a little bit. It's the nine and a half acres around you is, is us and our chance and place to experience God. So uh, we're excited for that. A couple extra announcements. Um, uh, firstly, we've, we've switched over, and we've talked about this as members for a long time, so this shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, there's one form of online giving now. Uh, this is probably be the last week we announce it. You can find that information on our website, but we just make sure that that's clear. We'll be shutting down the other one, and you won't be able to give through that platform anymore, but we just want to make sure everybody had lots of heads up on that. Second announcement, uh, I think beginning this Wednesday night, we'll have men's midweek uh, all through the month of January, congregational midweeks uh, here at the East Meadow Lane property. Uh, so that will be live and in person. Uh, we will not have live stream here uh, for the next month or so. So if you've been using that or, or waiting for that, it won't be available. We're still kind of building up the tech ministry. But our men's and women's midweeks will be here Wednesday nights uh, as we set the course for this spring, winter, spring uh, kind of semester in our midweek discussions. Uh, and then winter small groups will start uh, later this month in January. If you're planning on leading a small group, please reach out to me. We'll be coordinating how, who's leading those and making sure every family group has enough small groups uh, to meet the needs and that we're all on the same page with the direction of those groups and, and how we can help them to grow. Awesome. We're going to stand up and sing two more songs before we get into the Word of God. So join us as we worship. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes 
me sing. Your love makes me sing, sing, 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 sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. song to uh, lead us into communion. Lead me to Calvary. Oh, switch the uh... That wasn't that way before. <laughs> this is amazing grace. Yes. sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done. 
Just a couple more pieces of housekeeping for those of you uh, who had a full cup of coffee before you came. If you go out these doors up the ramp, you'll go into the central building. Our bathrooms are located there. There's men's and women's bathrooms uh, just outside over here in the main, uh, main building here in between. And then at the conclusion of the lesson, we'll, have, we'll take communion. If you didn't receive a communion cup and after we pray for communion, just kind of raise your hand and uh, Ben will come around and make sure you get one uh, at the conclusion of the lesson. So if you need to use the restroom, straight out the doors up the ramp. It's right in the central building there. Uh, and they're nice and warm and toasty bathrooms. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, God. We are uh, free to worship you in any space, in any place, and in any time, uh, God. But we're grateful to have a location to, to congregate, to meet, to be uh, centrally connected, and to uh, know and be in your presence, Father. Uh, we thank you for this space and this, this opportunity to worship you here. So grateful for uh, just the people and the hearts and the, the ability to come and worship you, to sing, to, to lift up our hands, to praise you, to be in fellowship, God. And I pray that you'd uh, just bless this time. Uh, help us to dive into your scriptures. Let them speak uh, to our hearts and let them radiate into our lives, God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have no Wi-Fi, so I have no access, so I'll just, I'll give Jason the code here and we'll, we'll go through slides. Uh, Jason, there you go. Uh, we're going to get back into Just Jesus. Uh, we're unpacking still, so when we find the Just Jesus poster, we'll put it back up. But uh, we're looking at the Gospel of John and emphasizing our focus on the things that Jesus said and Jesus did and really uh, just focusing in that Gospel only on Jesus. So in some respects, we're kind of ignoring the side characters, maybe ignoring the disciples, but we want to see how Jesus thought, acted, behaved uh, to really center ourselves on that. And slide two there. Uh, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John tells us this at the end of his gospel. This was the purpose of his gospel, the reason for writing it. And so as we dive through the gospel of John, we're going to steadily go back to this concept, that this gospel was written so that you and I would know that Jesus is the Son of God and that we can believe in him and have life, eternal life, abundant life in his name. And as we jump back in today into John chapter 7, I want to open with this question. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you realized you were completely unprepared? So we're all in this agreement. We've all had that moment. Maybe you walked into a situation, you thought, I got this, and then you realized, I don't got this. I know for me this happened many times in college, but there was one time where I studied really hard for a test, and I walked in and opened up the test and realized I had studied the wrong chapters. And I misread the syllabus, I skipped test prep day, which was a cardinal sin that I should not have made, and I realized that even my cheat sheet that I was allowed to have, let me qualify that, was the wrong chapters. So I had an entire sheet of notes that were no good for this test, and I was completely unprepared. There's going to be times in our spiritual life, and our spiritual walk, where everything we've done before, all the Bible study, all the prayer, all the relationship, all the advice that we've had before, will not prepare us for the moment in our presence. It may be a chance where we're sharing our faith with somebody, and we don't have all the right answers. Or it could be a sin that pops up in our own life, and we don't know how to navigate it. Or it's a sin in somebody else's life, and we don't know how to address it, or challenge it, or guide them through it. We will constantly face opportunities that we're unprepared for. And it seems to be have the apostles in the Bible had a transformational moment that somehow they went from completely unprepared, ragtag, goofball, fishermen, tax collectors, and outcasts into eloquent speakers who proclaim the gospel across the place. I'm going to just give this example. In the end of the gospel of John, Simon Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now that seems like to many of us, like, hey, uh, Jesus just died. We're kind of dejected. Let's just go on a fly fishing trip. We'll kind of get our brains back. You know, we'll just recollect ourselves out in nature. But really what Peter was saying is, I'm going back to my old way of life. I got to provide for the family. I'm going back to fishing. 
And then somehow later on in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, these two fishermen, stand up before the ruling leaders of the Jewish body and say, whether it's right in God's sight to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. So these guys who gave up and went back to fishing are now challenging the religious elite face-to-face, toe-to-toe. And what happens in between, I think, can help us to be more prepared for our spiritual challenges. And as we look in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages. The Spirit gave them ability. And then later on in Acts chapter 2, an important passage for all of us, that same Spirit is promised to us. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So for this fellowship, and those of us who have repented and been baptized are filled not only with the forgiveness of sins, but you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that took these dysfunctional fishermen into proclaimers of the gospel. And so I want to talk about today as we look at John chapter 8, having spiritual discernment. Steps to being prepared for the unpreparable. It's not about having all the right answers or having all the right skills or all these right things or you're just super special and you've got it where you can navigate every situation. The reality is that we're spiritually discerning what is God doing in this time and space. It's like the cheat sheet with all the right answers and the right chapters on it. We're going to encounter spiritual trials. We're going to face theological cliffs. We're going to be presented with opportunities for evangelism and spiritual discernment. Being able to look and see what is God doing right here and now? What is God calling me to do and be? Will help us to transform that. Turn over to John chapter 8. We're going to look at the life and example of Jesus in order to gain some tips for spiritual discernment. And what we see here in the beginning of John chapter 8 is Jesus' spiritual discernment in a very broken space. You're going to see a broken woman brought before him, broken accusers challenging her, broken people questioning God himself, and you're going to see Jesus use spiritual discernment to guide the process. We'll pick it up actually in chapter 7, verse 53, and you'll find out in a moment why, but I call this chapter 7b and not chapter 8. It says in verse 53, it says, Then each one went to his house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, This woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in questioning, he stood up and said to them, The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only Jesus was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. This is one of the most powerful interactions and narratives of Jesus encountering somebody in sin. And you'll notice if you have your Bibles, if you have a paper Bible, you really will notice. I don't know how it presents in digital, but generally, this is not accepted as being originally in the Gospel of John. It wasn't in the first manuscripts. You might even read that in the bottom footnotes. I don't know if you have to, like, touch something or flip it over upside down on your phone to read it. But it'll tell you that this section of Scripture was not in the original manuscripts. And it's perhaps not original, but it's definitely Jesus. It's kind of a floating narrative that was in search for a spot in the Gospel. And they placed it in different places throughout history. At times it was in Luke. And if you read the Gospel of Luke, there's lots of stories like this where Jesus encounters sinful people and outcasts, and it kind of fits in that context. 
And it's absent from almost every Greek manuscript handed down to us. And how do they know this? Well, 14 words in this are not found anywhere else in this gospel. There's a conspicuous absence of standard John language in it. And there's an absence of this kind of, in most of the pre, you know, old manuscripts. And so what most people believe is this has been floating around in the, in the circles of churches. And this story was shared in church time and time again. And we have little bits and pieces of it through manuscripts throughout history. And it was shared and shared and shared. And somebody's like, this has got to be in there. Where do we put it? Well, just put it right here because it's kind of in the temple area. So just slide it in here to John. And, and that's how we got it to where we got it. And that's why I call it John 7b, because it's not quite chapter 8, it's not quite chapter 7, it's 7b, and if you take it out and just read 7 through 8, it actually fits much better. And so they interjected this story, but it was accepted by all of early church history, it was written about many a times, and it may have been contained in something known as the gospel to the Hebrews, which we no longer have. And so that kind of explains it. So if you were questioning it, why is it in there, why do they have that, they didn't know where to put it, this is where the scholars put it. And if you look at it, it it may not have been originally in John, but man, that is so Jesus. Theologically, that fits with every other account of Jesus we have. Going toe-to-toe with the religious authorities, having grace on somebody. And for us, it really gives us a sense of who Jesus is in a powerful state. It's one of my favorite stories of Jesus in Scripture. But what I want you to do right now is I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Imagine this scene. It's early morning in the temple court. Nobody's gathered. This rabbi, Jesus, sits down. He starts to teach. There's kind of a commotion in the background. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees and scribes and religious leaders drag a woman and make her stand in the middle of Jesus' teaching circle. And they challenge Jesus what to do with this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus starts writing on the ground in the dirt. And then finally stands up and says, The person without sin should be the first to stone her. And then all of a sudden, that crowd of rebels dissipates. It's nothing but Jesus, the woman, and his disciples. Where are you in this story? There's no bystanders when we interact with Scripture. We're in the living story. We are active in it. Who are you? Where are you standing? Do you see yourself in the place of the woman? Do you see yourself in the place of Jesus and his disciples watching and trying to figure out what's happening? Do you feel yourself in the place of the accusers who are passionate about God and Scripture and want sin to be dealt with? How do you feel in response to Jesus' words? What do you see written in the dirt? Where we're at in the story has a powerful implication. You can open your eyes. There's really three perspectives here. There's the accusers, there's the guilty party, and then there's the spiritual discerning Messiah. Those are kind of the three actors, as you will, in this, in this scene. And what I want to look at is how does Jesus react? No matter where, hold on to where you were. If you were the accused, the accusers, or sitting with Jesus, hold on to that, but we'll come back to it. But I want to look at how Jesus acted in this and how we can follow this for spiritual discernment. Next slide. I think there's some steps here that we can take as we look at Jesus' response and how we can have spiritual discernment. How do we face a situation like this? Through strong accusation, a woman caught in the act of adultery. How do we handle these things? How do we pressure, how do we feel in these these pressure situations? If we look to Jesus, who is filled with the Spirit and one with the Father, we can discern some things and, and hopefully help us. Number one, you've got to know the Word of God. These people came in challenging Jesus on Scripture. They said, in the law of Moses, we should stone this woman. What do you say? If you don't know Scripture and somebody challenges you with Scripture, you'll always be unprepared. Spiritual discernment starts with knowing the Word of God. you got to know the Word of God. Jesus stands up and says, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone her. This is a direct reference to Deuteronomy 13.9 and Deuteronomy 17.7. They challenge Jesus with Scripture. What does Jesus volley back? More Scripture. And for most of our lives, the spaces and times we're unprepared usually have a deficiency of Scripture. The more we spend in Scripture, the more we allow it to resonate in our lives, the more we're allowed to process it. 
Like, let's not diminish this situation. This is a situation caught in the act of adultery. I, we got a mixed audience, so you can just imagine what that actually is implying for the adults in the room. Uh, and caught in the act. And the first question that we all should ask is, where's the other person? How did the guy get away scot-free? And I love this. I read this in one commentary. He said, maybe he was just more fleet of foot. He was just faster. It's just kind of that whole going through the woods. I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than you. And so that was their explanation in the commentary was the guy was just faster than the woman and the Pharisees couldn't catch him. My guess is it was kind of a worked out agreement that they would use the woman as a scapegoat and the man was let free. She was the one who was less valuable, less appreciated in society, and so she was the one thrown to the wolves. But to know the Word of God to, is to know that adultery isn't a mild sin. To look at our society, adultery plagues our society. It plagues divorced households. It plagues infidelity. It plagues relationships. It plagues trust. All of us have, many of us have lived a life where sexual sin and sexual adultery and, and sex outside of marriage has complicated our psyches. It's complicated future relationships. We know it's a serious sin. These guys aren't exactly wrong. But if you don't know Scripture, you don't know how to handle those wrongs. So we've got to know Scripture to know that this is serious. And to know that in our lives, we can't have sins like this. And in the lives of people that we're trying to help, we have to know the Scriptures to know what sin is. So the first step of spiritual discernment is you've got to know the Word of God. The second step is you know that you've got to know the God of the Word. You can know scripture, you can quote it, you can recite it, but if you only view it through your lens and not through the actual lens of God and Jesus, then it's just a weapon in the wrong hands. See, Jesus is the answer. He's that decoder ring. And I thought about this. We bought some, some sugary cereal. It's kind of a Christmas tradition. We let, have lots of sugary cereal in the house over Christmas. And I was looking at it, there, there was no toys in the boxes, can I just take you back? Do you remember when there was toys in the boxes? Now, as a parent, I realized that Hot Wheel was cheating me in my ounces of cereal, right? Because they measure that box, and that Hot Wheel was like two ounces. So you were getting cheated in cereal, but you got a toy in the bottom of the bag, which was probably not sanitary. I'm kind of explaining why we don't have toys anymore. But one of the things you would get is these... And I think older toys were the decoder rings that you could decode stuff, but we always got like the decoder bar and you could go read stuff on the box, but you could only read it on the box if you had the decoder bar. And if you had that little ring, you could decode stuff. You know what the decoder ring for the scriptures is? It's Jesus. You want to decode the Old Testament? You look at it through the lens of Jesus. You want to decode how to handle sins and circumstances and how to use Scripture appropriately, you, you do it through the lens of Jesus. He's the, he's the decoder ring at the bottom of the box for us. And if you notice in this passage as you're reading, Jesus stoops down to write how many times? Two times. And in both times, it uses the word grapho to talk about it. But in between those two writings, they bookend what he says about the death penalty. Which is fitting because if you read between the lines of the law, you see the intention of the law. So Jesus stooped down to write. He explains something. He stoops down to write again. Between the law, between the scriptures, is the God of the scriptures. And it's a lot like the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says repeatedly, you have heard it said, but I tell you. It's the Dakota ring helping us to understand scriptures, to know the God behind the commands. If you were to take the commands of God and just throw them on a wall without knowing God, they can be abused in many ways. But when you know the God of Scripture, you see that every law is filled with grace. Even the complex ones are filled with mercy. You know, this isn't a point to devalue Scripture, that, but we just should never settle for our own application. We should always look for how would Jesus handle this. Our aim must be to know the God of Scripture, not just know the words of Scripture. That's how we discern. You've got to know the Word of God, and then you've got to know the God of the Word. And third, you've got to read the room. It's one of my favorite things to, to say, and I tell this to people all the, all the time. Like, if you could just learn to read the room, you would know what was going on. I try to do that in my sermons. I look out there. If I look like blank stares and I'm not making any sense, I keep going. I just skip past all the rest of the notes because I'm reading the room. You're not with me. If everybody starts to fidget, I go, okay, everybody has to go to the bathroom. I need to hurry this up. Like, you got to read the room sometimes. 
Here Jesus reads the room. He understands human nature. You know, he understands the questions that should be asked that you and I ask too. Like, where's the man in this situation? It says she was caught in the act. That means there was somebody else there. Who and where did he go? He's asking the questions, what's the motivation of these teachers? It says John comments here for us is that they were trying to trap him. He's being trapped in two ways. One, between Jewish law and Roman law. Jewish law, as it said in the Old Testament, is that somebody caught in the act of adultery should be stoned. But that would generally kill the person. And at this time in space, that would be against Roman law because only the Romans could execute the death penalty. So Jesus is being trapped here between honor the scriptures or honor the Roman authorities. The other way that he's being trapped is if he disavows the law of Moses, then he's discredited as a rabbi and a teacher. But if he condemns this woman and stones her, then all of a sudden he discredits everything he's done and said about mercy and grace. And you want to talk about an unprepared situation. Many of us are not prepared for these dualistic challenges. But in this, he upholds the law in a way that puts people to, to rest and frees the woman through grace. He read the room. And for most of us, just reading the circumstances and reading the situation of what's going on here. When you come into that unprepared moment, what is the motivation of people? What's my motivation? What's the end goal? Reading the room and kind of discerning, what is God doing in this midst? And that can be really difficult when you're stuck in chaos. Maybe it's a challenge with your family and raising kids and you're in conflict. How can you read the room and discover where God is? Maybe it's in your marriage and you're in conflict with your wife and you're in an argument. It's really tough to read the room. Spouses are now looking at each other. Um, but it can be tough to read the room to kind of separate yourself and go, okay, what does God want from this? What is the outcome God wants? Where is the other person? But just learning to read the room. Jesus does that markably. He noticed that they're trying to trap him. He noticed that this woman's alone even though she was caught in the act. He reads the room. And then he goes on to, number four, lean into the weak. This woman's accusers are using her as a pawn to trap Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He leans into the weak person. We're reminded in Matthew that how he will not break a bruised reed and he will not put out a smoldering wick. The iniquity of the situation arouses our compassion. We're leaning into this woman in the text, but Jesus leans into it. What's our solution? How do you spiritually discern? Always lean into the weak, the outcast, and the oppressed. Lean into those people who don't have a voice. That's why Jesus loves children. That's why in Luke, you see Jesus lean into the poor and the outcast and the women, and those people take center stage. Why? Because God leans into those who have no voice. God pushes the church to be the voice for those who have no voice. That's why it talks so much about serving the poor and meeting needs and not letting anybody among you go without having some. That's why it says, don't just say, hey, go be well, warm and well fed, but not provide for the needs of our brother. Why? Because God leans into those who are weak. And as we're spiritually discerning how to handle situations, we should always lean in to help those who need help. We will all be weak at some point. We were all weak and helpless Sinful outcast, when Jesus died for us, Jesus leans into the weak. He could have leaned in hard to the law and held it. He could have leaned into the oppressors and let them have their way. But he leaned into the woman who was being used as a pawn. Not letting her go, not overlooking her shortcomings or overlooking how she got into this mess. We'll get to that in a moment. But he leaned into her to provide grace. To be the church of Jesus, we have to be a space where broken sinners can be repaired, restored, and reborn. Now, we're going to take the signs down, but we don't need signs that say new visitors, first-time visitors, or anything like that. We should be an environment where everybody is welcome. Broken, messed up, misguided, because that's how we all walk through the door. That's how many of us still are. There's a wonderful craft in Japanese art and it started around the mid-century where a pot was sent to a, to a kind of a samurai overlord and, and it was broken in the process and he was so upset about it. But one of his artisans took it away, and I'd love to have the name, but this is off notes, but and he took it away and he filled the cracks with gold and melded the pot back together. And it was actually more beautiful than it ever was before. Now this is a common practice of art where they'll break pottery and then bring it back together with gold and, and fine jewels. That's what we are. 
We come into the church, we come into the presence of God, and God leans into the weak, us. And when he repairs us, we're better than we ever were before. That's got to be the mentality of the church. When people come in stuck in their sins, stuck in their ways, stuck in conflict, stuck in hurts, we lean into them so they can be reborn and restored and renewed. Next, he leverages everyone's conscience. Whatever we do spiritually, it should be done in a way that calls everybody to repentance. What does he say to the group? He says, let him who has no sin throw the first stone. He accepts the law and what it dictates, but he, knowing the God of the law, he changes it. He goes, fine, stone the woman. You're right. It says it in the scriptures. Do as you will, but the first person to throw it should be the person with no sin. And wisely, of course, the older you are, the wiser you get. And the older you are, the more spiritual you might get. And you realize, I should walk away first. Jesus pulls no punches. The sin should be dealt with. But he says, you should deal with it if you're perfect. And in this situation, Jesus was the only one able to throw the first stone. And his response to the woman is, neither do I condemn you. Many manuscripts specifically say in their translations that the accusers were convicted by their own conscience. If we're leveraging, if we're having spiritual discernment, our sin should always be present in how we deal with somebody else's sin. It's easy to point out the sin of another people. It's easy to look down on somebody who struggles with something that you've overcome. But when you flip the tables and you see your own shortcomings, you deal with people a little more gracefully. If you've been through a certain type of sin and you encounter somebody struggling with that, you have an extra sense of grace for them in that area. And that's what Jesus does. He leverages the conviction to everybody. That we all should be convicted in how he deals with this woman because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're undeserving of grace. We're undeserving of mercy. And we should look through that lens and how we deal with everybody. We don't ignore sin in each other's life, but we look at it through the lens of grace and mercy that we've been given. Now, I may not sin in the same way you sin. And in fact, your sin might be more offensive to me than my sins are. You know why? Because I've gotten really comfortable in my mess. This happens all the time in our house, and maybe it happens in your house. I'm comfortable with the messes that I leave throughout the house. I'm really uncomfortable with everybody else's messes. That's how we can be with sin. You can be comfortable with your sin. Maybe it's pride or arrogance or, or, or boastfulness or just selfishness, but you can't stand other people's sin. And we deal with that in those ways. But in the scriptures, we leverage everyone. We look through the lens of our own sins to, to have grace on the others. And finally, you aim for gospel grace. The end result of spiritual discernment should always be the restoration of man to God, of woman to God. It should always be the good news of grace. That should always be the solution. Every conflict, every trial should be restoration of us to God and us to each other. If that's not your end goal, if your end goal is what you want to have done, that's not the gospel. It should be that we are all restored, that we have unity, that we have connection, and that people repent and are baptized and are one with God. Confidence in our personal absoluteness is nothing, but we have to have this desire for mercy. These men didn't care about the law. They didn't care about the woman, but Jesus cared about the law and the woman. His view was the perfect scenario to this. The aim was to have this woman restored to faith. And his response to her wasn't, you're not condemned, you're free. His response to her was, I neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's grace. That's good news. We have a world of just excusing people's sins and excusing people's behaviors, and that's considered accepting or warm or whatever. The reality is we point out your sin, we're confident and graceful in that, and then we challenge you not to do it again. That's gospel, and that's grace. When you imagine yourself in the story, where were you? I would assume that many of us felt like the accused. And if that's you today, I hope you find a space where this is a community where you can be challenged, that you leaned into, that you're leveraged in conviction and you're helped to have gospel grace. But I think if we feel accused, don't you pray for a community that has spiritual discernment like this? Because a point in time will come when all of our sin will catch up to us. 
Most of the time, I feel like our sin kind of misses the big ones and big situations. It's almost like a car accident. Maybe you've had one of these car accidents where you're like, if they just hit us six inches this way, we're dead. If that person had crossed six seconds slower, this could have been so much worse. This woman probably had committed this sin multiple times, and she never had a problem, but this day the Pharisees had an issue. This day they needed a pawn. All of our sin will catch up to us. That's why we live in a confessional community where we confess sin and help each other. The near misses of sin will run out for you. You will have the tragic experience. Your harsh words will hit in a way where they wound in a way that can't be repaired. Your sexual temptation will find an open opportunity. Your pride will damage a relationship beyond, I'm sorry, fixing it. And your little lies will add up to a monumental pile of deceit. It's then we need a community with spiritual discernment that aims to restore us, that leans into the weak and lifts us up. Maybe you were the accuser in the story. Don't you pray for a community with the spiritual discernment to be like Jesus and not like the accusers? Maybe you feel that harshness. Maybe you feel like there's sin in this fellowship that's just not dealt with and we just need to get the rod out and start, start cleaning it out. Aren't you grateful that's not our community? Now, I think we should deal with sin, but we don't want to be the accusers. Jesus could have passed judgment on the whole crowd. He did it in a graceful way in saying the, first per- the person to throw the first stone should have no sin, but he could have gone around and just go, okay, Garrett, this is your sin. So you're going to throw the first stone and then keep going through the audience. And he could have, I don't know why I only picked on you. I just stopped. I, I ran out of faces when I got this way. Jesus could have done that. But if we get off our high horse and our judgment, we can, with spiritual discernment, go, I've got my own sins. We need to help each other. And finally, to be like Jesus in this is our aim. And I pray that we'll rely on the Holy Spirit to know the Word of God, to know the God of the Word, to read the room, to read our houses, to read the fellowship, to see sin and challenges, and then to lean into those who are weak and struggling to leverage everyone's conscience, to look through a spiritual lens and aim for gospel grace. Because if we can all have spiritual discernment, we can save souls and be a restored community of broken people brought back together by the grace of God. Amen? Let's pray. And then we'll take communion. God, we are utterly broken by our sin, by the sins of others, by the perpetual just entropy and disorganization and chaos of our world. God, I, I pray that we can be a community of people who discern how to handle situations, God. There have been so many situations over the past few years that I have not been prepared for. God, so many mistakes I've made, so many opportunities lost, and God, I just pray that I can learn and that we can learn, Father, to be able to just discern where are you and what would you do, God. Help us to know the scripture, but to know you in the scripture. And God, help us to read the room and see where people's needs are and to lean into those who are struggling, God. Help us to leverage our own conscience when we challenge others. And God, help our aim always to be grace. God, we come to you in the newness of this space, but we just pray, God, that you would just make us new. And God, as we celebrate the communion that we're able to come to you to have the body and blood of Jesus that brings life, abundant life, eternal life. Help us to celebrate that, God. Help us to practice some spiritual discernment in our own lives and evaluate where we're at, God. And I pray that it leads us all to restoration and wholeness. God, we pray for this time of communion. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
first time in the new building. Amen. Isn't this amazing? I'm just glad to be here. And we will sing, Lord, I want to thank you. Wow. It's very loud. <laughs> Rocking it out. Lord, I want to thank you. Winding road, you share my love. What 